if after here you want to see it again, remember streaming live, you've got to be in front of your computer to do that, but in a few days it will be capable of being downloaded. And for those of you who are watching today live, thank you for attending. Now, I'll keep things moving as best I can. Introductions will be short, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. Please ask direct questions and avoid speechifying in a question, but we'll see how it goes. There are microphones in the front of the room, and we are going to ask questioners to use the microphones because that way it will be captured and broadcast on NCTV 18. We may be able to hear you from the back of the room, but the uh, online audience will not. And now I turn to my colleagues, the speakers. These microphones are unidirectional. They're very sensitive to us. But if I turn to look at Jen, it disappears. So if you want to turn, turn around the microphone. And that may include if you want to look at the screen while you're talking. If you're not talking, it doesn't matter. If you're not talking, it doesn't matter. Because we've got a lot of good slides to come. Alan, who's taking pictures, will from time to time wander to the back of the room. And if he can't hear you, he'll go like this. And I'll ask you to get closer to the microphone. And now, as a beginning, the threat of sea level rise, along with increased frequency and intensity of storms, says to me that seaside communities have three choices. And I reduce this to the simplest three R's. Rebuild, resist, or retreat. So this forum will let us hear from experts on how these choices might impact us on Nantucket. And to begin, my colleague, my colleague Charlie Stott from uh, the Manicut Conservation Found, uh, Association will capture what the students at Worcester Polytechnic Institute did here in the fall um, for one of their uh, very important educational projects. Well, thanks so much, Lee Saperstein, and thanks to all of you for joining us here this afternoon. Nantucket has hosted multiple teams of student researchers from Worcester Polytechnic Institute for the past 11 years. Each fall, several student research teams immerse themselves in studies of real world problems locally here on island, and they have to devise real world solutions. Over the years, the challenges we have offered to those students at this very local level have prompted WPI to elevate our program to serve as a global WPI project center, along with others in Berlin, Hong Kong, London, Melbourne, Tokyo, and others. Here on Nantucket, teams of students have completed 40 different projects addressing all sorts of local concerns right here on our own little island. Next. Last fall, along with my fellow co-president, Peter Morrison, we managed to gain approval for a project especially relevant for our Madigat Conservation Association members. MCA's Coastal Erosion Work Group drafted the initial proposal. The final study proved to be broadly relevant for Nantucket as a whole, and hence today's forum. Our joint efforts secured last fall's project team that you see pictured here. They've studied coastal erosion here on island, searched far and wide for approaches that other places have used to mitigate erosion. And they formulated recommendations for what might be done. They've sur surveyed our local public knowledge and opinions to gauge public support for the various mitigation options they've recommended. So today, I'll review what they have recommended. Here on Nantucket, coastal erosion is nothing new. Its impact, though, has worsened in recent years. Just weeks ago, the Historic District Commission approved the emergency demolition of a house on Sheep Pond Road situated only four feet from the bluff's edge. Our focus will be on the team's recommendations listed here. 
they can focus attention and hopefully spark discussion among the panelists and today's audience in attendance. Among the recommendations are rebuilding and conserving dunes, restricting beach access, using artificial reefs, creating a coastal overlay district, adopting setback laws, reestablishing the Nantucket Conservation District, and having an erosion control committee. Among the options recommended for consideration are rebuilding dunes. In some areas, dune fences have been erected uh, to rebuild dunes, and such fencing can be effective. This option involves an initial cost for the dune fencing, plus an ongoing cost for maintenance. Planting dune grass helps to preserve dunes, but only if people don't walk on the dunes. Successful dune conservation means you've got to restrict access to the dunes in vulnerable areas. Dredging for beach nourishment is an expensive but effective option. Here you can see the before and after photographs where this option was used by Cape May, New Jersey. One important point here, the spoils from any dredging must be compatible with the existing sand. Here on Nantucket, for example, it might be possible to dredge Madigat Harbor and then use the spoils of dredging to nourish Madigat Beach. Situating artificial reefs has stemmed erosion in some areas. An artificial reef can reduce wave energy, resulting in less erosion. Artificial reefs are also environmentally friendly, for example, by providing new habitat for shellfish. For Nantucket, we'd need more local data on sand movement around the island to implement artificial reefs effectively without risking other negative impacts. Next, the research team was intrigued by the proposal presented by part-time Nantucketer Joe Farrell. Joe owns Resolve Marine, a salvage company. And after a wrecked ship washed up on the beach, Joe spotted a gradual effect on the coastline over time. Sand was building up on one side of the shipwreck. Sand was disappearing on the other side. Inside Joe's head, neurons were coalescing into an idea. Joe Farrell's idea is for a pilot project wherein we sink one or more beach modules offshore, like the one shown here, 20 feet long, 10 feet wide, and five feet high. Fill these things with water, then anchor them to the sea floor. Waves would break on these artificial reefs rather than at the shoreline. Gradually, sand would build up behind the beach modules, creating a natural reef. Eventually, you pump the water out, the beach module floats to the surface, and you move it to the next location. Obviously, you'd need careful monitoring to avoid any scouring, in which case, you'd simply terminate the effort by removing the module. Next slides. Motor vehicles driven on beaches are far more destructive of vulnerable dunes than the people who walk on them. The student team recommends considering restrictions on motor vehicles while noting that the sale of beach driving stickers generates about 6% of the town's revenue. Next slide. So how does all this get done? Coastal homeowners and town officials should work together. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Vince Murphy, who serves as the town's Coastal Resilience Coordinator for Natural Resources, Director Jeff Carlson. Both are extremely knowledgeable, and we're delighted that they've agreed to participate today. A committee staffed by Vince and chaired by Mary Longacre presently coordinates coastal resilience efforts. It's the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, affectionately known as CRAC. Next, let's consider policy changes that could make a difference. 
One is creating a coastal overlay district along with limitations opposed on what could be done in such a district. Among such limitations, restrictions on new construction or establishing a lower building maximum height. A coastal overlay district though cannot apply to existing structures. Another pol policy change, adopting a setback bylaw which can restrict any new construction within X number of feet from the shoreline. Here too, a setback bylaw cannot apply to existing structures. The student team also recommends reestablishing the Nantucket Conservation District. This entity was established in 1949, but has remained moribund for decades. You'll hear more about this topic in today's final session. So where is <clears throat> consensus? The student team tried to poll about 500 Madigat property owners. Its purpose was to gauge people's receptivity to different options and isolate where there might be consensus. They managed to obtain responses from 172 of those 500 owners a respectable return that's sufficiently high to map the broad terrain of public opinion. I'll conclude by highlighting several useful findings. There was bold support for artificial reefs, and there was overwhelming support for setback laws. Four of five respondents wanted restrictions on beach driving. The student team recommended that once the Coastal Resilience Plan is completed, the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, in collaboration with Vince Murphy, should refocus their roles going forward. That is, in the future, the, the committee should function as an erosion czar, overseeing implementation of erosion control efforts and also planning and organizing future erosion efforts, 79% of respondents supported this approach. Finally, there was overwhelming support for the Civic League to provide information, coordinate efforts, lobby the town, and raise funds, all with our all-volunteer army of soldiers. Key findings. I want to include by mentioning the results of a couple of survey questions that caught my attention. Question. Are you of the opinion that nature should be allowed to take its course and no extreme erosion control measures should be undertaken? 40% answered yes, nature should be allowed to take its course. I surmise that most coastal property owners answered no to that question. Over 70% responded that owners should not be permitted to do anything they wish to preserve their property. I want to thank you all for your kind attention, and I'll attempt to respond to any questions during the Q&A session. Charlie, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, Peter Morrison, if you're listening, I was remiss in not introducing you as our co-president. We were on a conference call yesterday, and he's doing well after um, knee surgery. He says that he doesn't like the physical therapy, but it seems to be working. I'd now like to turn to our next topic, which is, if I'm gonna keep my face close to the microphone, I've gotta raise the page. Foreseeing what climate change means for Nantucket, and it's a joint presentation from Sarah Boyce from the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, and Jennifer Carberg from the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Doctors Boyce and Carberg are uh, the science coordinators for their respective organizations. And they're gonna work from the computer so that Vince doesn't have to change slides. Go ahead, sit down and, and, and start. But the, the, same, the same concern for the microphone. We're not used to sitting while we do presentations, so we're gonna, we're gonna stand. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then we can see the, the, the screen as we do it. Um, Fine, go. 
Thank you, Lee. Uh, we're just, Sarah and I are here to set the stage a little bit for what coastal resiliency is, what it means for Nantucket, and, and kind of some of the work that we've done that focuses on that topic. Um, so first, what is coastal resiliency? And everyone has a, a bit of a, a concept of what this means and what it means on Nantucket. Broadly, the, the framework that we work within is that coastal resiliency looks at the ability of an area to easily bounce back from a lot of natural hazards. And out here on Nantucket, that primarily means hurricanes, coastal flooding from storms, storm surges, the everyday flooding that we're starting to see as a result of climate change and increased sea level rise. We were seeing some of that this weekend, high tides and storm surges happening in town. Um, we're also going to have to look at impacts of increased drought, fires, and tied to that increased rainfall because we're actually going to get both with how climate change is, is acting. So we talk a lot, a lot about coastal issues, but there's a broader issues for within our island. And you know, I have a few pictures here of some of the key things that we see around Nantucket, particularly larger storm events, getting the flooding in town, getting erosion on our south shore. And the idea is that these impacts that we're getting are shorter term impacts that can end up having really long term effects. So we have a storm what that storm does to our infrastructure is something that could be in effect for a long time and impact our community. Um, but what coastal resiliency gives us is the ability to hopefully respond to those short-term hazards, because we can't stop them, but provide a way so that we can continue to still function and bounce back from those efforts. And for Nantucket, Sarah and I talk a lot about the fact that it's coastal resiliency, but for us as an island, it's community resiliency. Um, and that's because Nantucket as an island is almost essentially all coastal. Anything that impacts our coastal area impacts the whole community of the island. So there, are, and, I, and I love this graphic because our, our community is all of Nantucket. People use the island for so many different things and so much of, you know, a lot of us here are, are year round residents. A lot of the economy of the island that allows us to live here year round is based on our coastlines, is based on having a lot of these options that both us and people visiting the island for tourism come to Nantucket for. So you know, there's our transportation system, both the, the ferry system and the airports, there's people that do recreation on the shoreline, there's access to all of our unique natural resources. When we're protecting the resiliency of the island, we have to think about the island as a whole community. Um, and Sarah and I are gonna talk about some of those issues that are really specific for our island and what that looks like as far as our hazards that are impacting our resiliency. Um, one of the biggest issues is flooding. Oh, hold on, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a map of a project that was done for the island that looked at storm surge impacts. So not even taking into account sea level rise, but as we have increased um, storm surges associated with storms coming into the island, where does that water go? And it was estimated by looking at elevation and where our wetlands are and done at different foot intervals. Um, and we can zoom in. You can actually look at all of this information on the town's website. There's a town, it's called the Town GIS website interaction tool, and you can go in and play with all these numbers and see how these um, studies impact our island. But this looks at downtown, and you can see it's all color-coded, and then on the far right-hand side, you can see a box that says ranges, and it starts from five feet with the dark blue all the way up to 13 feet for the dark purple, and so that's that storm surge. And you can see that areas at Brant Point at just a six-foot storm surge are almost all underwater. Um, so this is an issue given the low-lying areas that we have on, on the island that is one of those coastal hazards that we need to figure out how to respond to. And just to show you the other end of the island, this is Madiket, uh, and you can see that, again, that dark blue is that five-foot storm surge, so all of the salt marshes and Eel Point um, and Warren's Landing are all underwater. Higher storm surges end up flooding more and more of the island and actually is... Sarah likes to point out, cuts off parts of Eel Point Road when you get, start to get high enough storm surges. Um, so flooding is, as I said, an island-wide issue that even if you're not in the most populated areas of downtown, can impact how you connect to other areas of the island. 
Uh, so we already talked a little bit about erosion in the last talk, um, and we also wanted to talk about sea level rise. And so just to set the stage, when we talk about sea level rise, um, a lot of times we hear the term like different scenarios and different timelines. And that's because um, when we look at the sea level rise projection, so what scientists taking all the data that has been and then um, making predictions about, about how much the sea level will rise, um, there are differences because we don't know how behavior will change. And there's obviously some um, you know, margin of error. Should I hit the next line? So um, this is about where we are right now. I kind of just fudged that um, line. And you can see that most of the different projections are kind of uh, agreeing right now about where sea level rise is going. And then as we move forward, um, those uh, numbers start to split. Uh, 2050 is a number that a lot of um, research and a lot of planning goes up to 2050 because that's where the numbers really start to diverge. That's the lifetime of a mortgage. That's like the foreseeable planning future. So um, if you look at uh, information from other communities and they're planning for projects or you hear um, us talk about uh, planning, 2050 and 2100 are kind of the, um, a lot of times the timeline marks. And then we can plan for these different sort of extremes. Of course, as we move forward um, in time, uh, that research gets kind of um, better and better with more and more information. So we use NOAA, the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, to look at their sea level rise numbers. And we have um, information specific for Nantucket, um, and anyone can view those. Um, we have links to all that on the uh, CRAC committee's uh, 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 reference site or on the um, town website. So um, just to, so that you know where the numbers are coming from and where there's some uh, differences in the potential um, projections. And um, we wanted to show you, you know, what does that look like on the ground? So we know that um, we have ideas of what sea level rise looks like and from the maps that Jen showed, what the storm surge looks like at different foot intervals. But the Preservation Institute for Nantucket, um, I know they weren't part of um, this, this talk today, so we um, were able to show some of their images, and a lot of people have seen these already. But um, they were uh, looking at the different sea level rise projections for downtown, uh, specifically targeting a lot of the historic areas and historic structures. But this is just kind of what it ends up looking like downtown. I'm, I'm sure Harvey Young is sick of seeing these. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you like to see this. So I'm only going to show you a few of them. But this is um, the corner of Easy and Broad Street. And this is 2019, so kind of what you picture now. Um, you can go next. And this is at 3.25 feet in 2040. Um, and this is just remembering um, that this is actually like sunny day uh, flood, so or the sunny day high tide. So it's not a storm surge. It's not um, an extreme event. This is, would be like a regular day. And then uh, four and a half feet in 2060. And then 2080, we have 6.14 feet. And then in 2100, it's eight feet. So you can see that in this area in particular, um, it's basically the harbor has inundated this area. Um, and then they, you know, if you go onto the Preservation Institute's website, there's a lot more of these different types of visuals, but I just wanted to show you a few. This is the Wave Shuttle Terminal, so this is part of our transportation area. And we don't often think of this as an area now that floods regularly. We think of Broad Street, we think of Easy Street, we think of um, Brant Point. But so this is 2019, and then the, this is 2080, so obviously um, a lot farther in the future, but you can see the water coming in, and once again, with a storm, that would be even more so. And then by 2100, we have eight feet of sea level rise, and this is um, inundated. So this is when we think about what are we planning for um, as a community? Uh, are we planning for 2050? Are we planning for 2100? Are we planning for storm surges? Are we planning for sunny days? So this is just kind of what that would look like. Um, and then, you know, we already mentioned some erosion. Um, this is information that we have from Mass, Del Mass Coastal Zone Management. Um, and you can see that these are um, combinations of how the shoreline has changed uh, over time. This only goes to 2009, so there's obviously more data to add on here. But you can see that red areas are the areas that have been eroding, and then there's some gray arrows that are pointing out, and those are the areas that are accreting. So it would be nice for us to know more about, um, I think uh, Charlie mentioned the sand budget, kind of knowing where that sand is going, um, and, uh, and adding to this information to plan for those areas. 
And so we wanted to know also what does that look like on the ground? What are we losing um, in terms of our natural landscapes and what are we gaining? So uh, this is a little bit of work that Jen and I have done looking at um, the change in habitats over time on Nantucket. So uh, in, two th in uh, sorry, 1998, the Nature Conservancy produced this really detailed habitat map for the island that had 36 different habitat types. So it really drilled down, and that's what all these different colors are on the map. Um, so basically 20 years later, we're in progress of updating this. We really looked at the coastal areas so far um, to see what actually has changed. Thanks. And so this figure just shows for the habitat types that have undergone change. Um, and so all the red ones are ones we're losing acres. Um, and the little yellow bars just highlight all the habitats that are in um, our most, um, our coastal communities that we really need to help uh, mitigate for the sea level rise, floods and things. So we have coastal dune communities, coastal shrublands, salt marshes, tidal flats, coastal beach strands, shrub swamps, um, all of these really important habitats to help that will naturally mitigate the effects of sea level rise and climate change. And then what are we gaining? So we know we're gaining developed land. That's not um, a surprise. But we're also gaining a lot of sand. And this isn't, you know, we're not building up additional um, upland. This is shifting sand, unstable sand. We'll hear more about it in just a sec. But it's um, keeping in mind that what we're gaining is um, something that's uh, temporary and, and moving constantly. So how do we achieve community and coastal resiliency? And I know you, you will most likely see this figure a couple times today as we go through here. Um, but this is the resilience cycle, or how a community starts to be able to develop resilience tools. Um, and as Nantucket, as an island, we are still a lot very much in that very top blue circle, which is assessing our risk and vulnerability so that we can figure out how to start prioritizing and planning the actions that we need to do as a community. Um, but moving forward, just to, to kind of reiterate, you can see it here, but it's, it's a cycle. So as we're working through this as a community, as we start to figure out what's at risk and what's vulnerable, and provide plans, but that's not the end for us as a community. We will need to implement, we will need to monitor and evaluate, see what works and what doesn't, see what continues to change going forward and react to that change, and then go back again and reassess where our risk and vulnerability is and what other plans do we need to implement. So as a community, this is a process that we are going to have to continue working through. Um, and so, as Sarah was mentioning, we have done some research that's looked at how uh, communities have been shifting on island. We've also been trying to focus in, you know, we work in the conservation world, so we tend to focus on some of the natural solutions or using some natural solutions in combination uh, with other resilience techniques. And we've been attempting to identify both the vulnerable coastal habitats that we have on island. Those are those communities that are at risk, but are also really vulnerable to loss through erosion or sea level rise. And then what kinds of uh, vegetation communities we have that are resilient to those changes. Uh, and that's what this map is. And this has come from some of that vegetation community habitat change work that Sarah talked about. How have the plant communities been changing? Um, and you can see the bright yellow over uh, Madiket, Eel Point, up towards Great Point um, in these areas all along the coastline. That's that increase in loose, unconsolidated sand. That's where it's being deposited around the island. Um, and that loose sand, there's no resiliency to it. Uh, it's been deposited and building up beaches, but as we observed yesterday for anyone who went out to the South Shore, is rapidly pulled away in any kind of storm event. Um, the, Orange that you see are our, are our priority resilient habitats. Those are those coastal habitats that are actually able to kind of bounce back with climate change. That tends to be our salt marshes and our coastal wetlands tend to be able to respond really well to holding on to the impacts of storm surge, uh, protecting the upland from erosion and mitigating those impacts. And then the blue are our coastal communities that are a little more less resilient, more vulnerable either because for an island, they host a lot of the rare plants and animals that make this island so special and, are, and can be lost to erosion and sea level rise. And so then just two kind of examples of how we can enhance coastal resilience. I'm sure these images are really familiar to a lot of you. This is um, by Millie's Bridge at the end of Hither Creek 
in Madiket, um, and this is a project that quite a few of us in the room are involved in in, in, in different levels, but um, in a storm a little over about two and a half years ago, uh, this whole area, as you can see by the bottom picture, what had been a really stable coastal dune and wetland system got washed over by waves and had a massive amount of loose sand deposited. Uh, and so thinking about ways that we can improve the resiliency of this coastline, uh, we're attempting to work on a project to stabilize that loose sand. So that loose sand on its own has no real resiliency, but there are actions that we can take that can help improve the resiliency through building up the dune, and then hopefully uh, we're working on a project that will have some uh, native vegetation planning that can stabilize that sand and trap more sand and build up that dune structure naturally over time. Um, that's one of the solutions that kind of grabs onto how do we handle the fact that we have these less resilient areas developing on our south shore. And then those of you that have heard me speak know that I'm a, a wetland ecologist and I always kind of need to put in the plug for salt marshes and how important salt marshes are when thinking about our coastal communities because they can provide so much resilience. And that was in that map that we showed of our shoreline. We actually do have quite a bit of salt marsh on the island that can provide a resilient barrier, a resilient way to hold on to water from storm surge and sea level rise. And so as a community, we need to think of ways to increase and build and potentially even tie hard solutions in with natural solutions when we're thinking about how we want to mitigate um, the effects of climate change on our coastline. And then just really quick to enhance that back to those pictures that we kind of showed at the beginning, this is just that storm surge data, but it shows you that the, the wetlands that are out in Manicut right now around Manicut Harbor, looking at those colors, that whole big blue area in the middle kind of takes you up almost to those culverts at Long Pond, that dark blue shows that those wetlands that kind of buffer between the end of Hither Creek, Manicut Harbor, they can hold on to storm surges up to seven feet right now, which that storm that washed over at the end of Hither Creek and took out the area where the Stilt House now is, was about a seven foot storm surge because we saw these wetlands completely full of water and they were able to hold on to that water not let it spill into too much over into Long Pond or into the roads and then slowly filtered it back out to the harbor. When you come down to town, essentially there's no place to put the water in Brant Point right now and you can see that you know you have some of that same darker blue color and the whole area is underwater because there just is nowhere to mitigate or move that water yet during a storm. Yep, I realize now as I'm saying this, those, the color bar isn't on there, but basically as you go from, you go from the darkest blue up in the top, that was a five foot storm. Um, there's kind of a, a, the blue that you see down here in Brant Point, that was a six foot storm. It, it's kind of hard to tell on here, but as you go through that even lighter blue that's around it then, and that's when it kind of crosses over into Long Pond at the top, that was a, just over a seven foot to eight foot storm surge. And then as you get into like the green, the red, and the purple, you're going up to 12, 13 foot storm surges. Uh, so that's when you're reaching your maximum. So even though Madiket right now can buffer storm surges of a certain amount, you reach a point where it's just no longer possible. Um, and a reminder that this data is not also tied to sea level rise, which would impact these numbers as well in the future. Uh, and then there's just some pieces of missing information. Sarah already said some of this on the bottom. You can see the currents of sand moving around the island. Projects that we do that are going to hard armor or change how sand is moving around the island. Uh, the, the piece that we really need to know to be able to evaluate how successful that is is knowing what that sand is doing now. So, you know, thinking about if we, we sunk something off the shore of, of Eel Point to help build Eel Point up, what is, what is losing sand? You know, where else was that sand supposed to go? What do we need to look for, for down, you know, down the road? So any of these resiliency measure, measures that we put in around the island, again, we have to think island-wide because what you do somewhere ends up impacting something somewhere else. Uh, and so a sand budget for the island is something that has is, is potentially been done other places and that we could look at having done here to start 
to understand where that sand is going. Um, and then the figure up at the top, since it's up there, is that you know I've mentioned that those salt marshes can mitigate water that's coming in with storm surges, but those water those wetlands would eventually get flooded by sea level rise. So we need to start understanding how we can help our marshes remain healthy and start to move backwards with uh, sea level rise as well. So that's a piece of of work that and information that we're working on getting. Oh yeah, and then uh, just the, the last bit, Jen and I are both on the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee, which you'll hear more about from um, Vince in a minute. But just a lot of the, the mapping and a lot of the information that we showed is already available. Um, the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee has on the town website a library that Vince uh, maintains. And anytime there's any new presentations or new data that we either discover or we present at our meetings, um, get put on there. So links to um, the NOAA Sea Level Rise viewer, um, you can view specifically for Nantucket and look at all the different scenarios. Um, all of the information that we presented that on the storm surge data is also in there too. So, um, And then the last little bit is uh, within the CRAC committee, we have an education subcommittee and we're working on um, brochures and information that we can put out for homeowners, renters, uh, visitors, general public, businesses. So we've got a long list of things um, that we want to produce, and we're starting um, we're starting that uh, currently. And so I would love to hear from this audience too um, what people are interested in and what kind of information they would like and you all would like. So um, we can take questions and comments later too. Jen and Sarah, thank you very much. Yes. That was thank very you. informative. We're now going to call on Vince Murphy, whom I first met when he came to Nantucket. Uh, to be a bird warden, uh, checking on the progress of the birds that nest on the beach. And congratulations, Vince. Or should I give you my condolences because you're our coastal resilience coordinator. And you know, people might even blame you. But I hope not. Uh, no, and I take it as a great compliment. And I uh, truly like and love what I do. Uh, and especially for this community. Um, I'm just going to cover... Vince, closer to the microphone. I'm just going to try and cover the kind of town's response to to uh, the issues that have been raised by Jen and Sarah uh, and also by Charlie. So I'll, just for my first slide, I love one of the images on this. The one on the left-hand side is uh, the emoji for sea level rise. So if your uh, friends are sending you smiley faces, you can send them this back that we're all sinking. <laughs> So I just kind of want to try and define coastal resilience just a little bit. NOAA has a definition of coastal resilience, meaning building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events such as hurricanes, uh, coastal storms, and flooding, rather than simply reacting to impacts. But this is nice, but it really doesn't uh, account for Nantucket's erosion problem, and it doesn't look after our historical status. So the Coast Resilience Plan will account for and be sensitive to both of those, even though the historic structures will be looked after in a separate plan. This is the from the town website as well. Uh, it was at the bottom of Jen and Sarah's. There's an awful lot of overlap in some parts of my talk than what Jen and Sarah had. So I was very thankful that they didn't read this one. This is the Coast Resilience Planning. Uh, uh, this is from a definition on, on of how the town is approaching it. Uh, coastal Community Resilience Planning seeks to improve the cap capacity of the community uh, exposed to extreme natural events to adapt to stress and change by resisting or changing uh, in order to reach and maintain an acceptable level of function. So but that's a, a kind of a broader way of saying that we'll take all of our challenges into account and try and deal with them. So you've seen this. I have a poster by the door that has a similar uh, thing on it, and I even have it in this presentation twice. Uh, Jen and Sarah have uh, explained what it is, and the important point is that we're kind of in the process, as Jen already said, of assessing our risk and moving forward into the planning part of it. Uh, it'll be uh, some time before we'll see implementation, but we can spend a lot of the time before implementation looking at how we're uh, impacted by chronic events so that we can continue to evaluate and plan better. 
So there's kind of some basic adaption strategies that we have to look at. Everybody knows the first three of accommodate, protect, and retreat. Um, we can either accommodate by going up, we can also protect, such as the middle picture at Dionys, where there are two bulkheads. The one on the left is a wooden bulkhead, and the one on the right is a sediment bulkhead of very large boulders that are doing about the same thing. The one on the right is from the Toscana website of a building being moved back. But one of the other things that we really have to consider is the fourth leg of the chair, and that is the regularly true tools that, uh, for adapting to the vulnerability, uh, for vulnerable strategies. So what is Nantucket doing now? Uh, what's the approach to coastal resilience? So we're in the process of developing a coastal resilience plan. This was recommended in the hazard mitigation plan. And the, that hazard mitigation plan also recommended a coastal resilience coordinator and a coastal resilience advisory committee. So the base concept is that it's a whole island approach. That's a term that gets said an awful lot, but it's kind of interchangeable with a whole county approach. We're also going to be including the interior parts of the island and Tokernuk and Muskeget. We're not going to leave anything out. So the town has now accepted a coastal resilience strategies document that has a lot of very interesting background information in it, and it discusses some of our vulnerabilities and risk. Uh, it's not quite a whole island approach, but it is an extremely good guiding document for the committee. So the organizational model. So we have a coastal resiliency advisory committee. It's made up of nine members um, that were uh, chosen by the select board. And these are one member each from the select board, conservation commission, planning board, harbor and shellfish advisory board, advisory committee of non-voting taxpayers, Nantucket Conservation Foundation, and three members of the public, uh, three at-large members. They were given a charge from the select board the committee will work with the Coast Resilience Coordinator to oversee and finalize the Coast Resilience Plan. And they, it also goes into more detail, quite obviously, uh, of how they're to undertake this. And then to support them, and also them to help me, uh, I am the Coast Resilience person. Hello. <laughs> and I work initially to develop the Coast, I'm working initially to develop the Coast Resilience Plan, and then later I'll work in the implementation of the Coast Resilience Plan. So just to talk a bit more about it, there were flyers by the door on the way in. These meetings are on the first and third Tuesday of the month uh, from 10.45 to 12.45. Where? In this room, right here. Uh, with the exception of rescheduled meetings, and they're public meetings, and all are welcome, and I encourage everyone to come as frequently as possible. They're also f recorded and on the town's YouTube, and they can be accessed there. But attending can be better because you can also give your uh, opinions, which we desperately need. Uh, the committee also developed its own mission statement um, separately. Uh, and I'm very, uh, very happy for one word in this whole uh, uh, mission statement development. The committee will work with the Coast Resilience Coordinator in the development, oversight, and implementation of the Coast Resilience Plan for the Town of Nantucket to address the impact of climate change and sea level rise. Sea level rise is probably the one thing that scares me most. The plan shall address planning across the system-wide needs of the community and includes social, cultural, and economic needs, infrastructure needs, and the needs of the natural environment. The preservation of historic landmarks shall be a component of this plan. So where are we now in this? So we're in, this, this is a kind of overview of the method of developing a plan. So develop a request for proposals so we can secure, uh, so we can send it to procurement and get it advertised. Uh, beg your pardon, there's a lot of going to be a lot of three letter acronyms, TLAs and this, Coast Resilience Plan, CRP, RFP for request for proposals. And then we're going to secure a contract with consultants. This will take about uh, 12 months of research for the consultants. Uh, uh, crack the committee and me, myself, the CRC, Coast Resilience Coordinator, will review and advise through the process. Community meetings and community input will be accepted at a few intervals in that process as well. That's a necessity. Uh, the consultants will eventually deliver a Coast Resilience Plan and it'll be reviewed by the committee and by the select board before it'll be finally accepted. So then we move on to the implementation side of things. 
So the Coast Resilience Coordinator, me, will work to find funding for these projects. And then the committee will review uh, and aid in project selection uh, and going through the adaption options, figuring out which infrastructure is needed and where. And my personal preference is always for green and grey infrastructure uh, rather than hard engineering solutions as, uh, will, will have to be the case in some places, but if there's a softer way of doing it, I'll take that. Uh, water management, and this is where, as Jen said, help our wetlands. Recovery and expansion of the wetlands uh, is, is sorely needed. Uh, erosion management where possible, and then policy changes. Uh, this comes back to the legal framework of the island. So, and then they uh, continue to review and look at adoption opportunities. So part of that lovely circle that we see, we constantly are reviewing and then going back to see where can we adapt to some more, where's the next problem. So this is where we are right now. We're still kind of in the early stages. We're almost finished the RFP so that we can get it, uh, start securing, uh, getting a consultancy involved. So the initial RFP is something that uh, the, I wrote. It was then reviewed by the committee and included an adaption for recommendations uh, to meet the committee's concerns. And it's kind of unusual for a committee to have such input in an RFP, but this also underlines the importance of the committee and it also shows the experience, uh, expertise that the committee and uh, that has and the available resources on island. So in terms of timelines, this is kind of one of the easier ways of looking at it. The red line that goes down through the end of month two is roughly where we are now. We're coming to the end of that initial process so that we can move on uh, to uh, procurement and get it advertised and get a consultant in place so that they can start working on it. So this took a little longer than expected, but there's a reason for that. It had to be right, and it takes a longer time to get a better product, but it should be going to procurement within the next week or so. Hopefully. So the, we also have to consider the other plans that the town has done along the way. So there are other complementary plans, such as the hazard mitigation plan, which was completed in April last year. So this contains a lot of recommendations that will improve island resilience in general, and it is aimed at general public safety. Uh, the Coast Resilience Plan is partly about filling the gaps in the HMP and looking at uh, flooding and erosion, particularly in coastal zones, and getting the resilience in those areas. So then there's another project called Resilient Nantucket Designs for Adaption. This is in progress at the moment. Uh, consultants are on board for this. And this is mainly looking at uh, the historical district and historical structures on island, and particularly in flood zones. Um, the Coast Resilience Plan will work in concert with this project, and there's much overlap with it. Though this plan will look at, uh, say, buildings where, there, where there's going to be particular effects and develop a toolkit for those buildings, the Coast Resilience Plan will look at the streetscape around them uh, with a historic eye to preserving that as well. And the advantage is that the historic areas of the structures and structures will already have been given due consideration so that we can look more towards the coastline, more towards the streetscape in, in, in the Coast Resilience Plan. Then there's a stormwater drain and survey that uh, was going to come out with recommendations, hopefully in the not too distant future. This is in progress at the moment and in research of the DPW. And this is going to investigate the public stormwater drain network on island and understand what we have and where there are potential to recommend improvements. Additionally, there's going to be one more uh, plan that's going to come along. It's in research at the moment. It's the Climate Action Plan. This will investigate and recommend uh, the uh, energy consumption on island and also look at our general climate resilience, not just to extreme temperature and extreme cold, but to other parts of how we can reduce our impact uh, on uh, climate by reducing CO2 and other types of emissions. So. We've, I've had a lot of text-heavy slides there, and I can only apologize. Let's have something a little easier and something nicer to understand some projects that are actually happening on island that the Natural Resources Department uh, are directly involved in. At Sackage Pond, there was that washover that took out part of the road um, about a year and a half ago, open to being corrected. And there is a project there at the moment to put some reef balls in place. This is. Um, going to take energy out of the waves so that there won't be quite so much impact on the road edge. There's also going to be plantings done behind it so that those uh, the natural vegetation can also uh, change the shoreline and make it into more of a, a grey infrastructure project, which is a kind of a combination of the plantings and also the fact that there's going to be oysters developing these reef balls, but the reef balls themselves are a sort of a little engineering solution, though they have their uh, uh, natural impact as well. 
We also are working on a dune stabilization project. Jen mentioned this one, and this is the area that's happening in. Um, she had nice pictures of it. This is kind of an overlay of the area shaded there where it says town of Nantucket in the center, where this planting is going to take place. It's just a little under 0.7 of an acre, but planting that with beach grass will end up giving some kind of green infrastructure resilience to this area. It'll just be planting. It'll help catch sand as it's blown along by wind. Uh, the root system will also hold sand in place. And uh, if there's another washover event, uh, the root systems will also hold uh, the sand from getting washed away. So once again, resilience is a process. Uh, but the important thing is that we're always planning to improve resilience. I know I had left time for questions, but I've also brought in one more slide. Yesterday we had a little storm, and I went out and took some uh, some pictures. So on the left we have Easy Street, uh, everyone's used to that flooding, and on the right we have a washover at my Comet Pond. The important thing to take away from both of these is that one is urban and one is quite far out in to the south shore, but we have the potential to use coast resilience uh, measures that will lessen the impact of both of these types of events. Thank you. Vince, thank you. That was really very good. Now, you did mention questions, and I'm going to suggest use the back of your agenda to uh, scribble a note for yourself, because we will have a question and answer period after all presentations. And next, my good colleague, Jeff Carlson, <laughs> to talk about resources right. available to the town of Nantucket. You've been labeled with coastal zone management, but you're you're free to go wherever you think. I'm going to go on a little walk about, I think, for, for all of these things. But um, since I know I'm going to get a few questions later and a few other people at this table are going to get questions, um, I'm going to ask a couple questions and make sure everyone's awake um, that's sitting out in the audience. So if you could just raise your hand, who in the room has been impacted by a, a coastal flooding event or, or a coastal hazard before? All right, so we're looking at about half the room um, for people who have seen it. So who have had friends and neighbors that have been impacted or displaced by, by a coastal hazard before? I think that's probably most of us here. Um, and then most importantly of all, who, who has survived maybe the greatest scourge of all? Who has had teenage children before? <laughs> Jeff, it's coming on to grandchildren. It, it, it is. Well, grand, grandchildren, too. So one of the things that I'm going to try to talk about with this is obviously uh, how the town is dealing with this. A lot of these projects can be very large and very expensive. Um, a lot of the, the projects are, you know, kind of what, what we joke about back home in Indiana is champagne tastes on a Budweiser budget. Um, and then we're going to talk about what my teenage daughter loves most of all how to spend someone else's money to achieve those champagne dreams. So um, there's lots of, lots of great opportunities with the state. Um, coastal resiliency, I know it's the, the big buzzword right now when we have great staff that's come in and great planning efforts that have come forward, but really the town of Nantucket has been talking about coastal management and coastal resiliency um, for quite some time. The town originally developed a coastal management plan in 2014 and that went with that, some action items that were there. And the, in 2014, 2015, the town received its first ever coastal resiliency grant from Mass Coastal Zone Management for some work out in Mattacat and Hummock Pond and um, up in Quays near the, the Chuck Row property in the parking lot there. Uh, if you have questions about any of those projects, talk to Dave in the back. I'll put him to it. <laughs> He's the one that signed those applications. Um, but it's a discussion that's not not new to the state and something that's been going on for quite some time and a lot of opportunities that the state has been presenting in various forms and various programs and it's honestly a bit of a full-time job to just keep track of all of those opportunities. So to run through a few, I know I was kind of put with, with CZM first so we'll stick to them. They're probably one of our greatest allies that we've had as far as a, a non-regulatory state agency to help us out with these matters. And, and the first program that they really rolled out that, that's been a great help to the town, and I recommend anyone to go check it out at their website, is they developed their Storm Smart Communities program. And it's a program designed specifically at dealing with flooding and erosion and tools that you can use on your own individual property to make your property more Storm Smart. And at the time when they came out with Storm Smart, no one was using the words resiliency. 
And this is what it's kind of evolved into their next step where they've gone into more resiliency planning and they have a really robust grant program all through the Commonwealth for resiliency projects. There's some really great ones um, from the projects we talked about earlier. We received a grant for this year for the Sackage of Living Shoreline Project to do the design and engineering and permitting for that project. But there's some awesome projects throughout the Commonwealth if you ever have a chance to go see. A lot of them center around wetlands creation, um, removal of hard infrastructure and replacement with, with green infrastructure. Um, and it's really just starting. It's the tip of the iceberg for these places. And unfortunately, regulations haven't caught up with the programs or the designs or the innovative thinking that's coming. And it's putting a real problem to groups like our local conservation commission, to uh, state and mass DEP and CZM, where people are coming up with these hybrid and innovative solutions that don't fit within the pretty box of their rules and regulations and their performance standards um, and really cause some issues. So from those programs with CZM, we've also evolved into Massachusetts and Nantucket is proud to be one. We are an MVP community uh, and the MVP program is something where I think some of you guys were there. We've had to do a lot of community outreach and it's really a community building exercising to identify our strengths and vulnerabilities and set a plan forward to try to address all of those in a timely manner. The first one for us, and uh, Vince mentioned it, so I'm glad he did, uh, the Resilient Nantucket uh, Designs for Adaptation, or I always mess up the name, but whatever it is, um, is an MVP action grant. And if we weren't an MVP community and hadn't completed that exercise, that would be a bill that we would be footing exclusively as the town. And in a town where money can sometimes be tight, and I think any of us that go to town meeting and talk about budgets and we talk about things like overrides and um, scary projects that cost $20 million and $40 million, that uh, every little bit helps. And being able to qualify for that's been a huge help. And that's something where we're, we're endeavoring to have an action grant opportunity for each round of grant funding that comes out just to stay relevant and stay current. So they've provided those. Um, Governor Baker in the last year or so uh, put about $2 billion towards environmental improvement and environmental resiliency um, through lots of different means, and that's funded some of these programs. So the state is definitely committed to a lot of these programs. They have lots of amazing resources for people to use, everything down from a homeowner level up to large municipalities and programs that are there. Um, but I definitely encourage people when they see the opportunities to come and participate through some of the charrette programs that you may see, through coastal resiliency listening sessions that I know we did for the coastal resiliency strategies, MVP program, those are all programs that are 100% reliant upon community participation. So I, I, I say, and I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm begging or pleading, because I, I definitely am not, but um, I spend a lot of time in meetings, and some of them are regulatory and not. And you know, our conservation commission meetings are, are typically some consultants in the board. When there's a hot topic on there, we, we see more people uh, which is great that people come when, they, when they're when they passionate about something. But then we go to other meetings with the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board, with Crack and those things, and the number of public is very small. I mean, usually it's, and not to, it's usually three or less for a lot of these meetings, and it's a, a lot of meetings that are, you know, not everything is as interesting as others, but those meetings are important because it's what enables us to enroll in programs to get funding for the town and what allows us to make our programs fit everything a little bit better and do a better job to, to address community needs. And it looks like everyone in here has been impacted one way or another by this. Um, I would just encourage you know, vigilance and participation is really what's gonna make Nantucket resilient, not, not walls or core or wetlands or those things. It's the people will make it resilient because we'll, we'll, we'll will it to be that way. Um, I was going to leave more time for questions because I tend to get more questions. So I'll wait till to the end, but I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Lee since I didn't really do a formal presentation. So I'll leave Jeff, it at that. thank you. As I introduce Dr. Menz, um, Annie is the owner of the property that was on the map, 8 Ames Avenue, private property is how it was labeled. But she said, I understand 
NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, based on how they're helping me. But I don't know everything there is to know about this service. And I said, well, I might be able to help. In teaching mine reclamation, which has a synonym of rehabilitation of drastically disturbed lands, I found that there was this extraordinary resource that used to be called the Soil Conservation Service. It was established in President Roosevelt's time because of the Dust Bowl. Um, and then when the country realized that there was so much more than, while significant and important, than the agriculture in the middle of America, they renamed it the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So I'm teaching project management to seniors and I'm saying, when you're done, you will have a report similar to what a consultant would give to a company, and it needs to be based on real things. Go to the NRCS and get your material. Well, as I began, I went to the district office, and this is a lead to what Bill Greeter is going to be talking about, the conservation district, and they handed me a shelf full of paper manuals. If you're a farmer and you're building a small dam, there's a dam safety uh, module. If uh, you're concerned about restoring land and keeping it from eroding, there's a fantastic computer program called the, it's a computer program for the revised universal soil loss equation. Download it, I had students work with it, and they were able to manipulate, well, what happens if there's no vegetation? What happens if there's forest land? Well, what I mean, when I say what happens, I mean how much tons per acre of soil is going to erode, and what happens if you have mixed grassland and forest, and of course the erosion falls to almost nothing. So Annie ends up with a lot of sand in her backyard, <laughs> and she's looking for help. So with my little introduction, I'm going to turn to Annie Menz to talk about the linkage that you got, the, the, the help that you're getting from real people uh, in the NRCS. Thank you. Um, 8 Ames Avenue is uh, right close to Millie's Bridge. In fact, it's right there on the left-hand side before you cross over, cross from Millie's Cottage. The cottage, the house, albeit uh, a couple renovations, has been there since the early 30s. And, um, I can tell you a lot about the land and what it looked like during my uh, growing up, but right now we know what it looks like. Um, October of 217 and March of 218 were not very good months in Madiket. That's when the washovers occurred. And um, that beautiful, beautiful marsh that was in front of my house or uh, to the side of my house, I always call my house in the front, the front facing the, the basin, so that's, that's my front yard, so to speak, not my backyard. Um, no more marsh, no more pond, no more pier, no more mooring, no more bay uh, flowers, no more shrubs, sand, about three acres of it. I guess if you wanted to be real positive, you could say, gee, that would make a great volleyball court or many courts and you could have a good time there but it was it looks really awful it's very barren although in the last year I think we've had a little bit of dune grass and and Jen can give you the names of some of these plants that she's found there that I can't even pronounce but anyway um, granted I'm very lucky the house is still there the stilled house and the house that was in, in front of me uh, facing the surf are gone. They had to be demolished because the washover was so potent that it just, they couldn't withstand that. The bridge is still there. And um, because there's no uh, dune and because the sand is, is moving, uh, it's moving all the time, and I can tell you about that from yesterday, that um, the, the Hither Creek is, is, is filling in. And how far, it, how far it is, I don't know, because it's, it seems like it's, and with the, the um, tides coming in, sometimes it's, it, there's a lot of water and sometimes there's no water at all. The bridge, the bridge is there, but if there's a washover, there's, a, you know, there's real danger to that bridge. 
uh, yes, uh, this morning I was walking across the bridge taking the dog for a walk, and there was three inches of sand right on the, uh, on the road, and that was just from yesterday's windstorm. So uh, that, the sand is just moving all over the place. Fortunately, um, with the help of Jen and Jeff and Vince, we do have that dune planting uh, pro project in place. Um, it, the plan was written out. Uh, there was a lot of uh, involvement with the Madiket Coastal Re uh, Erosion Committee, and uh, as of what Tuesday, when was it that when was it that we went to the meeting? Uh, you guys went to the meeting and. Yes, last Wednesday, went to the Conservation Commission meeting, and they are seeing that through. And hopefully it will be approved by the end of this month, and then we can get some dune uh, grass growing in the spring or planted in the spring. We'll have to have volunteers, so hopefully we'll get some help from you folks. Um, if you can visualize the land, you can visualize what uh, what the um, Nantucket people own, and you, you, you folks, Nantucket land, what I own, and then across from that, across from the pond, as I call it, is the Audubon, a Massachusetts Audubon land, and they have a lot of land. It goes from the road all the way up to the beach, and it's parallel to uh, California Avenue, and California Avenue is that dirt road that, that's on the left-hand side after you cross the, the bridge. So we're talking about a lot of land. However, um, I think that, as you said earlier, somebody said earlier, I think it was Vince, that said that we would have, what, uh, almost an acre of, of dune. So there's several acres left that do not have any um, vegetation on it at all. Uh, in the course of, of um, being concerned about this, I was able to get involved with the um, the district conservation person at the Natural Resources and uh, Conservation Service. Her name is Maya Halta. And I made a phone call and um, got somebody, I don't even know who I talked to, who referred me to Maya. And then she said, send her an email. So I sent her an email. And in September of September of this year, of, of 2019, she responded. And in November, she came to the island and looked at the property. Uh, and the, I had sent her material about what was going on, what the land looked like, and so forth. And I also sent her a picture of the uh, pond and the marsh, and even my boat in it. It was a great picture, because that marsh was beautiful. And so, but I didn't tell her it was a before picture. So when she came to the island, she came to the house, and she was kind of walking around and just really not too, didn't seem too terribly interested. And I was thinking to myself, what the heck's this all about? So um, she said, is there some place that we're going to go to now? And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I want to see the land you're talking about. And I said, it's right there. She said, what? And I said, yeah. She couldn't imagine, couldn't believe that that sand had covered the marsh like it had. It was just, she said, she's never seen anything like it. So immediately she got very interested in it. And in the process, we now have a plan. And we are going forth to put some uh, dune grass in, in my place as well. Jen, uh, even though I hate to hear it, said that the marsh isn't going to regrow. She says, the vo she says there's, what, four to five feet of sand there? Yeah. Definitely on your side, there's enough sand that we haven't seen the the salt marsh growing back through it. We're hoping over on the Mass Audubon side that we could get some salt marsh <laughs> restoration, but yeah, that's right. a little ways down. Yeah. Sorry, so I'd like to have it dug up, but it's not going to get dug up, so uh, we'll, go with the, we'll go with the grasses. Um, the... What, what's going to happen now is that we're going to go through a, certain phases with the, um, the, the commission, the conservation service. Uh, there are certain steps, and the steps are um, time consuming. I'm hoping that if, if, if I get selected, that it will happen in the spring along with the project that we're doing with um, Nantucket, but who knows. Uh, the initial contact and development of a plan the application process paperwork, which is where we are right now, and field, 
visit for, uh, for um, finalization, I'm assuming that they'll come back in and take a look at the uh, property because as I said to her, do I need to get it surveyed? And she said, no, we'll take care of all that. We take care of all the technical issues. So at this point, um, she doesn't have any surveyed work or anything, but she says that that will come. And then the evaluation and ranking and selection, there is a ranking process, and the ranking according to the literature that I've, that I've read is based on improving water quality, improving soil health, I should put my glasses on so I can see, um, soil health to reduce erosion, and enhancing existing conservation practices, which uh, you know the erosion would certainly fit in my in my situation, and um, the final step would be the contract. Now I thought that they would go ahead and do all the work, but what happens is I get a contract and I get funding, and then it's up to me to find the landscaper or the contractor or whomever that would buy the plants and then plant them, and then the the um, NRCS would come back in to make sure, monitoring and make, making sure that um, we did what we said we were going to do in the plan. So that's that's where we are now. Um, I I just I need to say one other thing, and that is that I really feel like I've gotten a lot of support, and there's been a lot of interest, not only for myself but for all of Madikett and Smith Point res residents. And for a time being, we didn't think that was happening much out in Madikett. Um, I know that I'm a landowner and I'm just a small pea in a big pod, and I know that the road is important and the bridge is really important, but I just want to say that I feel blessed that I've had some help. Annie, thank you. It's a very poignant um, recitation of the fact that this is real, um, but that there are real resources. I mentioned uh, NRCS and all their technical literature. If you've got a pen and paper, of course, it's www.nrcs.usda. They're part of the Department of Agriculture, .gov. And on their front page, you don't, have to, you don't have to dig down, there are several sidebars, one of which says technical resources. The field office technical guide was the one I was using. Not hundreds, but thousands of pages of resource material. Um, and then on, I think there's a right-hand sidebar, it talks about conservation districts, which a bill is kind of my segue in, into you, because the conservation districts both provide local technical support to help understand what's in all that literature, and as Annie points out, will also help um, in such funding as they can find available for local projects. Bill. Thank you. Bill Greeter from the Madiket Conservation uh, Thank you. Association. Uh, this past year, I was at a, at a meeting, I won't say where, uh, to discuss a beach grass restoration project at the washover at Millie's. And at that meeting, there was a representative of the United States Department of Agriculture, Meyer, and she mentioned uh, that it was a real shame that Nantucket's uh, county conservation district wasn't uh, active. So since I didn't know what that really meant, um, I went home, and the web is a wonderful thing. And uh, so I researched to find out what that was. Well, in 1945, the Massachusetts General Court um, addressed the conservation of soil and soil-related uh, issues within the Commonwealth. And they came up with creating uh, these conservation districts. And with the passage of this act, Massachusetts became the 47th state. Of course, you know how many states there were at this time, so we certainly weren't on the cutting edge. Um, to pass legislation enabling uh, it possible for the creation of a conservation district um, along with other counties in the Commonwealth. Um, no good legislation goes untweaked, as we know, and of course, Massachusetts is famous for tweaking. So in 1947, uh, when, we when it was established in Massachusetts, there was three, they call them supervisors, which are members of the committee. Um, and they had to be land occupiers or owners of agricultural land. And in 1954, somebody said, well, three is not the number. We need to have three to five. And then again, in 1955, they tweaked it some more. 
and they placed it under control of the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, the Board of Agriculture. Well, then in 1956, they added uh, flood protection and prevention of sediment damages. And then in 1963, it was the last real tweak. They abolished the State Soil Conservation Commission, and they put it under the auspices of the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture um, Division of Conservation Service and Committee. I think they get uh, points for making the name as long as they could. Um, so that's, that's where it stood. Um, so in researching, uh, I found out the, um, as, as Lee uh, talked about, it came, uh, started from uh, the Dust Bowl days, and it was concerned about the farming uh, lands in the middle of the country. Um, and they were organized within state government. They're semi-autonomous, and, and currently in Massachusetts, it's like most things, it's unfunded by state government. Uh, as I said, Nantucket's district was formed in 1949. Well, why should we care? What do we, so what? Well, the answer is the USDA has revamped its definition of agriculture and farming. Just because an activity doesn't include driving a tractor or some other farm equipment, doesn't mean that it's not farming. They've broadened it to include marine and waterway activities, such as eelgrass planting, oyster growth programs, shellfish and beach grass propagation, and waterway culverts. And if you've been reading the paper or paying attention to uh, different meetings in town, a lot of these projects are currently in existence uh, on Nantucket. There is very little funding at the state level However, there is significant funding at the federal level, and that's Maya's group uh, comes into play. So since that uh, initial August um, look into it, I uh, found out that um, the main players to deal with is the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, which is the Commission of uh, Conservation Soil and Water Related Resources, the NRCS, which is a Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is under the auspices of the United States Department of Agriculture. And they provide uh, leadership and partnership uh, to help people conserve, maintain, and improve our natural resources. Uh, and then the last uh, group is the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Districts. They're a nonprofit group uh, um, headquartered on the mainland and they work with uh, 14, the 14 conservation districts uh, included um, in the Commonwealth. And Nantucket, um, although it's inactive, and that's the current state of Nantucket's district, is that it's inactive. Um, but it's still a currently approved district. It's managed by five to seven supervisors. And part of their mission is to search out grants for projects within the district process applications, and work with local nonprofit and municipal entities for funding. So what's next? The next thing is to uh, get it revamped, revitalized. Uh, so in working with the commission out of Boston, uh, the plan calls for, uh, uh, and, and this will be advertised in the Inky, uh, be holding an election to uh, get the membership or uh, supervisors uh, reinserted uh, in the commission. Uh, the supervi elected supervisors will be sworn in uh, by the state, and then the district will begin its organizational structure and start its work. So um, I, I, I'm happy to say that I've made more progress in the last six days than in the last six months. Uh, yesterday I talked with uh, the Cape District uh, they are very, very uh, far into the process. They've got a um, former worker for uh, Delahunt uh, as their leader. Um, he's essentially a lobbyist. He goes to Washington a lot. And they've been able to secure millions of dollars of funding for projects. Uh, if anybody's been uh, to Sandwich, to the Sandwich Beach area, and look at, uh, been down to the dunes, there's a long uh, boardwalk that goes all through the dune restoration project. That was all done um, under an auspices uh, on the Cape. So while I don't expect uh, any of us in this room 
um, are short enough in their uh, lifespan that we're going to see a project uh, that great accomplished in our lifetime. But certainly, uh, we can work towards reestablishing the conservation district and help uh, projects all over the island uh, from uh, existing farms, startup farms, uh, eelgrass projects, oyster growing projects, culvert uh, uh, replacement, and uh, work on, on the ditches and whatever. So um, I'm really excited that there's a, this possibility is there, and uh, we'll see how it is uh, going forward. But I'm, I'm really um, more optimistic than uh, a month ago. So thank you. Bill, thank you for taking the lead in this. Um, it's my understanding, and again, as, as you said, the web is a marvelous thing. It's my understanding from what I read, the conservation districts belong to the state. They're funded from the state. The state doesn't have enough money. So I'm presuming that local municipalities, of which Nantucket would be one, uh, probably have to uh, at least co-fund um, the thing. You don't not, think so? Not, not from what I've been told. Uh, it's uh, pretty much autonomous from town government. Um, there's no, if you go down to town hall, you can't find anything about that has ever existed. Uh, they deal exclusively with the state. There is a state, some, uh, I believe there's some state funding, a small amount for some um, uh, office type work. For Staff support. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's a small amount, maybe $7,000. The bulk of the funding would come from federal grants. No, um, I, I understand that, Bill. But I'm thinking in terms of staff support because of the dynamics of, of working with volunteer supervisors means a point of contact, a coordinator. Yeah, it, I mean, it's going to be an evolving process, but the, um, quite frankly, the good part about it is that it is autonomous from local government, and so it, it, can, it can branch out uh, into areas um, that the town would find problematic because of statute right. and involvement and stuff. So it's, I think it's really going to be uh, an exciting possibility. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I, I, I've got two, two, two things here. Charlie wants to jump in, and I want to invite Dave up. Uh, is that what you want to jump in about? No. No. OK. Charlie, stop first. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, expand upon the last two presentations relative to reestablishment of the Nantucket Conservation District and the uh, Natural Resources Con Conservation Service of the United States Department of Agriculture. And who would have thought that the Department of Agriculture would have anything to do relative to uh, coastal resilience? Um, but, but they do. And there's a ton of money available to either nonprofits or private property owners, but generally speaking, not to uh, a town or, or the county. Um, so Annie is applying for funding for beach grass, beach grass to preserve the new dune that she's got uh, as a neighbor. Um, but other individual property owners that want to take steps to mitigate coastal erosion in, on their property uh, could also apply. Um, now one thing about the conservation district, if it were to be reestablished, is that if a homeowner or a group of homeowners wanted to apply to um, NRCS for money for planting dune grass or taking other uh, mitigation steps, they would have to do it, submit individual applications, not only to the, um, the department, but also, I assume, to, um, to CONCOM. Uh, but if there were a conservation district in, in effect here, um, then that district could bundle applications from multiple owners, and there'd be one filing process is my understanding. One other thing about the money that's available from uh, Maya Halter and, and uh, NRCS is that we mentioned the, the Joe Farrell project, the beach modules that uh, we talked about at the top of this meeting. And she said that there's a, it's conceivable that such a project could be funded out of their innovation with an innovation grant from that department. Uh, so there's all sorts of opportunities. As Bill mentioned, um, the Cape Cod Conservation District has gotten a ton of money, in fact, specifically $10 million from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So uh, we, ought to be, uh, we ought to be looking very carefully at those options. Thank you, Charlie. I think that's important. Uh, Dave, as you come forward, uh, 
you have the misfortune of having been mentioned by Jeff Carlson. Dave Franzuto, <laughs> former harbor master and retired as our emergency management coordinator for the town. Um, and I think emergencies have become more and more frequent. <laughs> Is that why you retired? Yeah, they're more frequent. Uh, the, to the, uh, the Soil Conservation Service, back in the late 90s, we received the $200,000 grant from the federal government to build the wetland that's down uh, at the end of Washington Street across from Charlie Sales, which treats all the stormwater all the way back to Union Street. So that was, I believe, the last project that was funded by them. But to Mr. Uh, Greeter's point, it, it is a federal program. There's, there's no town funds needed. You apply, the town applies, the Conservation Commission approves, DEP approves, but it's funded by the federal government. So it's, it's, it is a good program and really needs to be reinstated here. Dave, thank you. And at this point, we're open for questions and answers. Uh, questions, if you uh, consider the person to whom you are addressing the question, uh, let her or him know. And uh, please use the microphones. Again, I'll remind you, uh, that way that's recorded for uh, the television. Oh, dear. Moderator. Uh, so I'm going to turn to... Uh, Coming. Okay, Ian, Ian Golding. <laughs> <laughs> I can win. Well, I, <laughs> oh, oh. Guaranteed to wreck the joint. So, um, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, I, I don't understand closer, why... Closer, closer, closer. I don't understand why um, Annie's sort of marsh wetland can't be sort of... There can't be an effort to replicate that. Uh, going forward, since it's obviously going to become more and more important as we have sea level rise, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of volunteers to go in and do it by hand if necessary, rather than just have dune um, preservation. So that's my question. I Thank really you. appreciate that support. <laughs> do you want to take it or do you want me to? <laughs> do you want to go first? No. Go for it. <laughs> I, I guess I'll, I'll try to go first and, and let Jen supplement there. So. This is again kind of one of the areas where I briefly touched on where regulations haven't necessarily kept up with changing conditions. So one of the things that the State Wetlands Protection Act discourages is resource area conversion to other resource areas. So the original intent of that was to kind of counteract a time where people were taking their, their marshes and their wetlands and their bordering vegetated wetlands and making open water resource areas, because they're more desirable at a time and things that were there, but the regulations that are in place kind of prohibit changing what was naturally accreting dunes back into salt marsh if it's filled it in. So that's, from a regulatory standpoint, it's a little bit tricky at the moment. Um, I mean, I think there's a, a, a school of thought in there somewhere now too that people are thinking that salt marshes are of extreme value and buffer from a lot of these damages um, better than a lot of other resource areas at times. Um, and I think there's some value. I think, I, I tell everyone, it never hurts to, to kind of kick the tires and ask the question and apply, but I don't think right now the regulatory climate would really allow for a project like that to happen. In the future, maybe there will be some more flexibility in with that. Um, Editorially, I think it would be really nice to build in people the ability to provide better functioning resource areas to buffer themselves from those instead of using engineered solutions. So, you want to add in on that? I mean, that that's that's really the basis of why it's hard to attempt to get that salt marsh back is because currently projects like that haven't been permitted, at least in the state of Massachusetts. Um, in order to get the salt marsh back in front of Annie's house and elsewhere around uh, that pond, you'd have to go in and m remove a significant amount of that sediment that had been deposited. So it would call, you'd actually have to go in and change what was technically a natural process and then go in and, and remove that sediment back out. Uh, as far as whether or not you could actually physically restore that salt marsh, 
I think you most likely could if you could remove that sediment and get back to some of that that base salt marsh um, sediments that are down there. If you took the sand out, you'd have better success stabilizing the top of the dune first, which I think is one of the reasons it's nice that we're going ahead with the planting project first. And, you know, when Annie told me what Mia said, I said, that's great, but maybe you should also ask her if it's possible to get the salt marsh. What what were the steps that the you know NRCS would recommend? And so there's a possibility we could have that discussion going forward, but then it would also come down to how that would end up going through the permitting process. Mm -hmm. But and, and I and I do just want to do a plug. A lot of the stuff that we keep saying with how we're adapting to and responding to climate change and to sea level rise, we also keep pushing that idea of those innovative solutions, that some of the solutions that might work to protect areas from sea level rise, storm surge, erosion are things that have not yet been developed or permitted. And I think that as a community, we're going to have to be open to what we're interested in experimenting with. Questions? Ginger Andrews? Yeah, hi. Just tug, Hello. just tug it down so you're comfortable. Hello there. Yes. Um, so I I would just like uh, to put in a little plug. I'm intimately familiar with Annie's uh, uh, surroundings. Um, walk it once at least once a week with the dog. Just about for the last oh I don't know umpty ump years. My dad served in the Coast Guard station that washed away in 1958. So. Uh, long family history with that particular part of Madikot. So uh, one of the things that I'd like to offer is my observation that the uh, just because it isn't growing grass and gaining in height, the remnants of that salt marsh that are buried under the dune still uh, have a natural effect of um, slowing erosion because the um, uh, the impact the um, compacted um, roots and mud that goes down to the depth of when that salt marsh first began to grow, maybe, oh, I don't know. It depends on how deep the roots are. Most of our salt marshes, if I understand uh, from Sarah Oktai's time, uh, a lot of them have been measured. There's Most of them aren't deeper than about eight or nine feet. So uh, the ages of our salt marshes are maybe... 4,000 to 8,000 years old. So that's not very old geologically. However, those roots do tend to uh, resist wave action. And as the, dune, the dunes on the south shore have been retreating uh, as long as we've been observing them. So the, the dune retreat itself is, a, is going to be a very hard process to stop or reverse. Um, so, but you know, don't despair just because it isn't growing grass on top. You still have the, those uh, uh, densely compacted root systems uh, under the um, under the dune at extreme low tides. You could see them where they had washed, you know, uh, washed washed out along the edge. Uh, so particularly at this time of year when erosion is at its height um, or depth, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you can see the compacted pond mud from freshwater sediments at the end of Long Pond, which is also experiencing dune retreat. Um, so the other thing that I draw your attention to is uh, the area down at the creeks where Hurricane Sandy moved the barrier, this fairly narrow barrier dune inland over the marsh so that now what you have is, and the, uh, as you go down in front of Charlie Sales where the project wasn't done, where it's just the natural system, you have uh, Spartina patens on the inland side and Alterna flora coming up on the other side as, the, um, uh, as that narrow barrier beach moves inland. So what I want to say about Madikit is that you're in a very different wave climate. And the dunes may actually offer you better protection than just uh, trying to scoop them away and try to go back to when sea level was lower. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I think uh, we need to consider is the projects that um, Dr. Tiffany and my father uh, did back in the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, studying how erosion has 
been working on the South Shore and the, um, the tendency of the offshore shoal to uh, control the hot spots and you know, there's areas of accretion, there's areas of washing away. As Jen pointed out, that unconsolidated sand is not gonna make a nice stable property line for people to buy and sell. You know, at the Conservation Commission, I used to really wish sometimes that we could be arguing about what to do with all that extra land where it was building up. Well, it's not building up, it's moving around. Um, but, so we need to consider what's happening offshore, particularly, and the um, effect of uh, fishing draggers with heavy gear that have a tendency to change the bottom. It's a drowned coastline, so, uh, Sometimes you'll you know, get you know giant poison ivy roots and things washing up as as the the um, the wave climate changes the angle of the wind. Uh, that's what makes uh, you know trying to do engineering projects so um, frustratingly uh, uh, unpredictable and short lived. Um, I'm sorry, have I taken up Ra too much yeah, time? Wrap, wrap it up, please. Well, all right. That's that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, You'll hear more from me later. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? We in the back. You can tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Bert Balkine, and uh, it's going to um, piggyback and something. Now, now you can lift it up. I don't want to break it like Ian no, did. No, no, just, just. <laughs> there you go. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I want to piggyback on um, Ginger's, some of Ginger's points about. Um, talked earlier in the discussion about sand budget. Mark Borelli came to the island in October of 2018. He's from the Center of Coastal Studies, and he gave a really great presentation at the um, NHA about um, how he's um, formulated and implemented sand budgets for the Cape. And uh, well, I think one of the key things that the start of this process is we need to have a sand budget, understand um, what we have on the island, where it's going, where it's coming from, until we have like a baseline of information, it's gonna be hard to do a community-wide plan uh, that you know encompasses our sand moving. Uh, so that's that point. Uh, and maybe jumping to the end, uh, the process seems like, as Vince said, it's going along and it's moving in this timeline. But I was thinking about, the, um, about measuring effectiveness after we've impl implemented some of these programs. And um, as we're not, addressing the bigger pictures of frequency of storms and increased vulnerability of, we're still building on our shorelines. We're still, we're not creating um, wetlands that protect, Jen has some proposals, I know, I know Sarah and something, and Jeff too, but the bigger picture is we're building, we're putting up walls, and um, as we do that, I, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be hard to measure effectiveness um, because um, we're increasing the vulnerability um, and um, and the frequency of storms. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, as as a teacher, uh, we were continually implored by our university administrations: make sure you understand what your students have actually learned. You're in the classroom for learning, not for teaching. And so that's an effectiveness measure. And I appreciate it. Can I, can Other I questions? Actually, can I comment on sure, Spruce's yeah. comment? Um, so I think we agree, Spruce, that we have to do a better job with getting some of that baseline information. And, and I feel pretty comfortable in saying it is one of the things that the town is looking to develop in the next two to three years is a comprehensive dredge plan for the town. So looking at our, our harbors and some of our entrance channels, whether it's Pulpus or Nantucket or Manicot. And one of the things that's critical with that, obviously, is what's gonna happen with those sediments. And I think coupled with that, we've actually asked Dr. Borelli to put together a scope of services to even look at an island-wide sediment budget to fuel that, that dredge plan component. So if we're gonna be having the availability of, of sand for potential reuse, to know where to effectively put it. Um, for those who haven't seen uh, Dr. Borelli present before, it's really interesting work that he does and some of the real highlights to kind of water it down, and I know he'll tell me that I skipped all the important parts, but when he's looking at it, you're really looking at these sediments moving in kind of a positive or negative direction and then finding these nodal points where it transitions. And why that's important is 
traditionally for a lot of beach nourishment for areas that are of any kind of length that's kind of a one size fits all you know we're going to put made up numbers we're going to put a thousand cubic yards of material across a thousand feet and we're going to do that evenly because that's just easy to do and what makes sense and kind of the crux of his studies are you're going to identify these areas and as you put that out you may be better to create a taper through there so instead of having you know a cubic yard per foot you may be front loading an area where you're more prone to erosion and depriving an area that's more prone to deposition in an effort to create a more stable shoreline so that's a really like 10 second summary but I think that's exactly what we're hoping to kind of develop for both our inner harbor areas and then the perimeter of the island as well um, Nantucket's no stranger to coastal erosion or coastal stabilization projects that have nourishment components. Uh, I think anyone that's gone to a conservation commission meeting in the last probably five to seven years, you better chance than not to catch discussion of it, of at least one, whether it's on the inner harbor or around the coast and how we figure out nourishment and what goes on. And I think that having that tool will be invaluable to especially that regulatory board to really do a better job refining what those those sediment sediment nourishment programs look like in understanding island wide. So um, I'm excited to say that we agree and, and that's in development. So hopefully when we all revisit this topic in three to five years, we have a really awesome plan um, and study to kind of reference and 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 go through and and take care of that. So it's a little update. Can I just add on that, um, to see Mark Borelli's talk, the NHA usually keeps all their brown bag lunch talks recorded and it's on YouTube, so you could probably see Mark's talk as well as on the Center for Coastal Studies has all the, the information. Um, so you go to the NHA.org website mm -hmm. and at the part of their page that talks about the food for thought, there's a link to the YouTube. Okay, um, great. And, and then you just search on the, on the one you're looking for. You can also go to the Coastal Coastal Center Studies website, and he actually did a really nice TED Talk recently, kind of on the methodology of that study. Um, that's also really interesting if people want to see that, too. Thank you. Uh, I see Dave again. And then there's a... I, I did see your hand, man. Yeah, Nantucket was the second community to do the storm tide pathways that Mark Borelli did, and it actually identified all the points. You, some of the maps that you saw earlier today were from his his presentation, and it's on there. But it basically looks at per foot where the water and how the water gets into these areas and floods it. And it's really interesting for property owners, especially because they can do certain things on on a on a on a, on a local level or or an individual place. To Jeff's point about the dredge plan, the dredge plan is, is almost done. And what it does is it identifies all the areas that have been dredged in the past and the cubic yard amount and the areas that need to be dredged in the future. And the reason that's so important is, I use Pulpus Harbor as an example. The, the, the permitting and funding for Pulpus Harbor when we dredged it in 1993, yeah, I know I'm getting old, 1993, the process took us about four months. We just dredged it last year. The, the process took us over two years. And of course, that means more dollars have to be spent with consultants and permitting and everything else. That's why the dredge plan is so important. You have to identify so early now to just to get the permits. So the dredge plan will, will then, uh, what, it, what it does is, Madigan is a perfect example. You know, last time Hither Creek was dredged was 1985. So you dredge Hither Creek, you dredge uh, the entrance channel into Pulpus Harbor. Where's the logical place to put that sand? In front of Annie's house and that that area. It's good, clean sand. That's where the that was where the disposal site was in 1985. So that means that that site has been permitted, so you can reuse it. So these are all you know pretty important dynamic things that are going on that, that, to help the island. Dave, thank you. There's a question here. Hi, I'm Mary Chalk, and I live in Madiket. I just want to um, ask a question about Joe Farrell's modular plan. I understand he's approached um, the town of Nantucket a few times, like in the last 12 years, 
with um, a similar plan, and I think he had like a shed placed out on Smith Point with instruments, and there were buoys out in the water. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what those approaches were about and why they did not go forward, because I believe they really, he was in the permitting process for them. Sure, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that one too. Um, so Joe has been been on this idea for, for a while, and he did have that shed out in Manicot out at the end, of, I wanna say, New Hampshire have for quite some time collecting data and collected a lot of data on currents and wave energies and, and wind and, and water temperature and air temperature and um, a lot of physical parameters. And I know he's also been working uh, with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute on, on some of these ideas. Um, to this point, Joe hasn't applied for any permits from local conservation commission or the state for any of the projects. So. Just like any other project, whether it's Andy wanting to pay, plant grass or, or, or the other coastal stabilization projects, kind of their initial review comes at the local conservation commission level if it's a project that could impact the environment. So until he puts together a full proposal and engineered plans and the science behind it and gets that in front of the permitting agency, it's an idea that's just moving around. So. Um, I mean, I'll say I spoke to Joe again kind of late fall, early winter this year about what was going on and where it was, and that conversation was left again with you need to compile your information and, and put together an application and apply um, and you know let the project be judged on its merits and see if you're able to gain permits or not. So that's kind of where that project is sitting currently. Um, Joe is super busy too, so I know um, last time I talked to him, we moved our meetings twice because in the period of two weeks, he was in uh, he was in the Bahamas, and then he was in uh, South China, and then he was off to Norway again. So he's moving around with his, his company. Um, but I know it's something that he's actively pursuing and has talked about trying to get in for potential permitting some point in the near future. <laughs> I can add a little bit to what uh, Jeff just said. When Joe first started advancing this idea several years ago, uh, he talked to town officials and for some reason or other never gained any traction, so he abandoned the notion. But over the last year or so, we in the Madigan Conservation Association have established a email relationship with him and I've met with him once or twice um, at the location on Milestone Road where his uh, modules are. And he wants to bring his shed back out to, uh, to Mattica to conduct more tests with all of the instruments he's got in that portable shed. Um, but um, he, uh, he really is interested in doing this, but as, uh, as Jeff said, uh, he's all over the world. Um, but we've got a, uh, an attorney on our um, uh, coastal erosion uh, work group out in Mattica that has offered to work with Jeff and sort of build a pathway legally uh, for him to begin to apply. Um, I think Joe's the kind of guy that just, I wanna get this stuff done and doesn't have uh, a real appreciation for the, the process to, uh, to get the permitting accomplished. So we hope to be able to assist him in facilitating this project. Thank you, Charlie. And I am looking out for more questions. I see Harvey, and I've got a question, and it's a short one. This has been so informative and so useful. Are you getting cooperation from the Inquirer and Mirror uh, in terms of being able to report to Nantucketers a progress in some of the things you're working on? And you as anybody here at the, at the table. I can say from the crack committee, I haven't seen any representatives from the newspaper at any of our meetings, but our meetings are often recorded, so I don't know. Um, and our new, I mentioned the education subcommittee from the uh, Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee, and that's newly formed. So we're, I think as, as Vince pointed out with his timeline, you can imagine this is gonna be a longer process of actually coming out with the plan, you know, hiring the consultants and coming out with the plan. And so in the meantime, a lot of what we're gonna be focusing on definitely as a subcommittee, and I'm imagining as part of the larger committee, is a lot of the outreach and education. And I think that's when we hope to tap more into the, um, the different media. Thank you. Mr. Harvey Young. 
Thank, thank you, Lee. My name is Harvey Young. Um, thank you for this presentation. It's pretty awesome, and I really appreciate it. And, um, and I'm glad I kind of got over being totally shocked when I see what a normal high tide is going to be <laughs> in 20 years, 15, 30 years. Yeah. A normal high tide down on the strip where I am doesn't include a little storm, a little surge, a little full moon. Um, I have a, a two-part question, and it, it gets us back down to the downtown commercial area. Do you, um, and I'm not sure who it's directed to, maybe uh, Jennifer and Sarah, do you see places in the town around the harbor where we could actually could create more marsh? Because it seems like a marsh is just a giant sponge that takes up a lot of storm. And another part of my same question, or, or a separate question is, do you ever see a time, maybe for Vince, down on the Strip, can we get it up? Can we get it up on the Strip? Like, can we just raise the grade between the Steamship Authority and the Whaling Museum and just raise that all up? Thank you. Harvey, I think you just kind of hit on your campaign motto for raising money for uh, <laughs> doing work down on the strip there. <laughs> you could sell t-shirts. I know, I think yeah. you could sell t-shirts. Um, I, I, I think that thinking about ways that we can put some of those more natural areas in town with the barriers that we already have is one of the best resiliency tools we can start to think about downtown. Um, you know, one of the things, Sarah and I went to a, a conference up in Maine a couple months ago, and it was all about coastal communities within the Gulf of Maine, and a lot of what we were hearing was, you know, let's protect these areas, and then eventually we're just going to have to retreat. And we kept looking at ourselves going, but we live on an island. <laughs> we can't just retreat. <laughs> you know, we will run out of space eventually. And thinking about how we protect downtown because there's so much both historical and infrastructure and really our, our line to the mainland and where mm -hmm. our economy runs through, Nantucket needs to think about how we protect downtown without changing the character too much. And, and I think that there are, there are certainly places where we could look at enhancing the salt marshes that exist, see if there are places where we could actually construct something with some engineering techniques that would help buffer some of the harder um, bulkheads that we have in place. If anyone here attended the, um, the Nantucket uh, Coastal Conference that happened last June, the keynote speaker was um, someone who was here from Puerto Rico, and he, he gave a, a whole visual um, pictures of the shoreline of Puerto Rico and what happened when the hurricanes came through. And his biggest message was the more natural buffer you have along your shoreline, the better you're going to be, because that's what they saw with the hurricanes that came through. And so the work that the land bank is doing, even just creating those natural parks along Easy Street are still giving us some of that buffer space. So I think starting to work towards that as some of the resiliency ideas, I, I think will come up as the plan comes together. And I think we need to start thinking about being open to things like that. Yeah. And just to get to the second part of your question about raising the whole of the downtown up potentially, um, I, I don't think that there'll be a one-size-fits-all answer like that. That might be partially something that might be done in, say, one area. You might be just looking at a suite of solutions. So some buildings will have to get adapted. Other buildings will um, have to be retreated or raised. Um, then in, say, some other areas, there might be the potential for a, a barrier that could try and keep water out of certain areas. Or you might be just looking at more drainage options. It'll be a whole suite of solutions to try and make the area more resilient for as long as possible. There's a section within the coastal mapping called filled tidal lands. And our downtown, from somewhere in the middle of the town building out to the water, mm -hmm. is filled tidal lands. Mm -hmm. um, so that, 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 that's our challenge. Harvey and I are railroad nuts. Harvey, you know that Easy Street used to be a wooden trestle over a marsh. Well, Young just built on Phil. Yeah, well, we know that because you're, 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 you're inland. Young says so, on Phil, Dreamland is on Phil. Well, the, yeah. the Dreamland came on a barge. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's history. So, <laughs> I'm going to make an observation. I'm going to tell Jordan. Lu Lu Lucille, come up to the microphone. Thank you. Um, I own 8 Federal Street, and a number of years ago, we had a horrendous smell in the building. And um, really what it was determined was all the fill that had been used to create dry land. Some of it wasn't very clean? 
well, it, it, was, it was a shellfish smell. And um, so uh, anyway, I hired uh, Tosiana and got all the permits through the town. And we, I actually had that because I have a driveway. So nobody could park back there, and we were able to continue to use the building. But I had that all dredged out, and it was definitely fill all the way up to Federal Street. And I was told that there was a marsh that, you know, off of um, that marsh area around Lily Street. Mm -hmm. That was, it, it came, you know, the water came all the way into there, and it was slowly filled in, and it included all the way up to 8 Federal Street. I, I was... I was stunned. I had no idea. But once that was, um, we put a, a, a partial foundation and a lot of concrete, um, the smell went away because there, there was no way to reside in that building with that. It, it just smelled like we were walking into rotting fish. Oh, my goodness. So thank you, Lucille. Um, I think there are a lot of properties in the town. In, 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 in the uh, filled uh, area of the town. I didn't realize it came up that high, is what yeah. I'm saying. Oh, okay. So I, if I can weigh in on that, I, 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 think, I think having a good view of that history is really important, and it's important to get out there because I don't think a lot of people realize the extent of the wetland loss that we've had, especially in our kind of our core downtown. But it's also something that when we're talking about it, I don't think there's a reasonable expectation to say we're going to pick up downtown and move it and rebuild wetlands. Mm -hmm. So this is where adaptation is going to be critical in our areas where we're, we're densely developed. It's a very historic resource, but it's things where, you know, we get asked a lot. And, and again, I think I encourage people to go to a CONCA meeting and listen to it sometimes is we're dealing with people that are coming in on a lot by lot basis to say, I want to do this project, or I want to do it, but it's things where traditional solutions and traditional ways we're doing things don't accommodate that anymore. They don't accommodate what's going on and, and doing things where you're looking at even runoff from your own lot and trying to you know, create a bioretention area or some sort of vegetated swale for water to go instead of just putting it right into the ground where you know, in downtown groundwater is 24 inches below the surface, you're pretty much putting it right into more water with more water, just making more and more water. So being innovative and being willing to, to compromise and create that extra space on your lot as you're, you're developing your property or you're working with your property to say, I need a place for my water to go and I need a place for it to be, just trying to put it under the ground on Nantucket doesn't always work, is finding a spot to say, I'm going to use plants and I'm going to use good soil characteristics to find that place to go and being receptive to that when engineers or landscapers are talking to you about that. It's going to be a bit of a shift, especially for the downtown area, but I honestly think that as far as personal property options go, that's, that's a better, simple direction for a lot of people to go in. I was about to shut this down, but we're getting some questions, and I, I think since you've been such a good audience, questions are important. I just want to, the point that Jeff made is that none of these solutions should be individual homeowners, individual lots, individual properties, individual anything, because as you point out, and I've talked to Jeff about similar situations, what you do impacts your neighbors. Mm -hmm. So you cannot look at it on an individual basis anymore. Thank you. No. We're, we're in this all together. Whole Island, I think, was mentioned several times. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, you raised your hand. <laughs> or you can put it back down if you want. <laughs> I may well regret this, but uh, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm about a fifth generation person coming here. That doesn't even compare to Mr. Greeter over there. But I have seen more destruction to this island that's going on. I'm going to refer particularly now, somebody just mentioned the lily pond. We have now approval of a home being built in the lily pond. Approval done. Go down some time. I can walk my dog along the edge of the lily pond to take advantage of the open end of the lily pond. It's so wet. I can't imagine how all these things are getting approved. Mm -hmm. The same individual who's got permission to build this megalopolis down in the lily pond area 
behind uh, the restaurant there has the development going out on the road to the South Shore. The, whatever it is. I don't know if that person's here or not, and I don't really care. Same individual owns, I think, at least maybe a quarter of downtown now where he's going to redevelop this whole area. This island is changing so much in my 75 years of coming here. I'd hate to wake my grandparents up and let them know what's happening. They would be appalled. You know, there's one thing to deal with the water on the outside of the island. It's another thing to do what we're doing on the inside of the island, for God's sake. Enough said on that matter. We're not going to spend a lot of your time on the lily pond, but uh, I want to reassure, no, I want to reassure John that there is an awareness of the drainage problem, and people are working on plans to uh, Remediate, would, remediate is the word yeah, I was one, looking for. Uh, remedi one would think that they would work on the drainage problem before the gentleman starts to build a house there. We hear you. I, you may agree, but I would be willing to bet you $10 right here in front of this audience that they'll start building before you've remediated the problem. I'd be willing to bet you. Okay. You know, so uh, you can't move slow yeah. like an elephant on this one. As, as my wife, who's here in the room, will attest, Lee doesn't bet. <laughs> I'd um, like to thank everybody. I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually going to. Can we have gonna, one more? For one more? Yeah, of course. I, 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 look, they leave if they don't like what you're talking about. <laughs> well, good. Well, I'm the new guy, so hopefully they like what I'm talking about. Uh, but I'm Sam Kefferstan, um, representing Mass Audubon. I'd like to thank everybody here for. Uh, uh, well, welcome. If you didn't hear, Stan? Sam. Sam. Sam, Sam is the new director for the Mass Audubon here on Island. Yes, thank you. Yay. The new Ernie. Good to be here, folks. Um, but I, I'll keep it brief. I know we're going over. Um, but first, given the regulatory levers and that it's not quite keeping up with our ever-changing world and climate change, sea level rise, what are the steps that we can take or that you all believe we can take to affect change is this how can we advocate? Is this going to take an act of Congress and speaking with our state representatives, or is this handled at the municipal level? So that's step one. Um, and then my second question, um, so I come from Andover, Massachusetts, that was impacted by the Merrimack Valley gas crisis. Uh, for those of you that might know um, what that was, um, it was a huge gas explosion, and we needed all new infrastructure in our town. And so the message from that was we didn't have a plan in place for that perfect storm. And so we just went back to the status quo and it installed however many hundreds of miles of gas pipeline that if we're going to reach our climate goals and you know combat the climate crisis, we need to replace now by 2030 and spend billions of dollars doing so. So in the coastal resilience planning, is there place for a perfect storm scenario? Say. Um, a large storm does hit the downtown, and there is, a, you know, it's a tragedy, but also an opportunity to really um, rebuild and think differently. Um, so thank you for your time. Sam, thank you, and thank you for coming. I was going to prime the questions with a couple of my own, but I'm not because we're past 3 o'clock. And I appreciate everybody who's attended. Those of you on television, <laughs> thank you. If there are any valedictory comments from Jeff Carlson. Sorry, I, I'll Answer take it because Jen and Sarah both pointed to me. So um, to <laughs> Sam's comment, I, I think it reiterates where, where I talked earlier in my really brief presentation. And I think the easy answer to that, Sam, is participation by the people that are in this room and the people that you know care and, and, and deal with it. Um, the easiest way to affect a change at our local level is we're still blessed to have, um, you know, town meeting and weekly select board meetings and a lot of other committees that are there. Go and attend, demand the things to be changed. You know, participate. Let them know. Let them know that things need to be better and and do that. If they hear it, it's a big help. It's a big help to the regulators to know that they're doing doing the right things and making the right decisions, um, whether it's at the you know select board or NPDDC or planning board or I can go on and on but you know well show since up and participate. Since you've mentioned the planning board, 
The chair of the planning board has I, just uh, walked up to the microphone. Folks, uh, she paid me for the segue. Uh, I, I just wanted to let people know we're in the run-up to doing the next iteration of a master plan for the island that happens about every 10 years, and I think resiliency is one of the top items on the list, as is infrastructure, to touch some of your points. So uh, please be aware that's going to take place for all out over the next couple of years, and there'll be surveys, there'll be a lot of meetings and opportunities, but uh, thank you to the Civic League. We've met with them and hope that they're going to help in doing outreach, and uh, hope that all of you here will bear that in mind, because uh, it, as others have said, it can't just be one person at a time. It's really all of us together. So thank you for the great panel, and just uh, if you have thoughts about that, you'll have many opportunities coming up to weigh in. Thanks. I'm not sure you introduced yourself well. Judith Wagner, Chair of the Planning Board, thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to say that was the last comment. <laughs> okay. And thank you all for attending.